so I'm Kevin Stone. I'm one of the co-founders of Havelide Systems with uh, Dr. Stephen Boyd. And I was coming here to talk to you today about another uh, non-nuclear application of thorium, in this case uh, for medicine. We can see in the OECD data that the cost of health care is rising worldwide. In the U.S. it's much more extreme, but we still see the same effect going on elsewhere in Europe. In addition, hardened bio th weapon threats loom. Um, the CDC in particular is concerned about anthrax. It's a serious disease caused by bacteria that can form spores. In particular, um, it's naturally resistant to antibiotics and the CDC is worried about someone taking this bacterium and genetically engineering it to make it even more antibiotic resistant. Antibiotic resistance is also a concern uh, even with non-engineered uh, diseases. As you can see here, this is the healthcare cost and utilization project uh, statistics on hospitalizations for MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylo Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, it's pretty much uh, a disease of the skin that you get and it will literally eat holes in your skin. People have lost limbs. Uh, because of this and is resistant to most antibiotic treatments. As you can see in the statistics, uh, the hospitalizations appear to be exponentially growing. Furthermore, HIV is devastating developing economies. Uh, this is the UN data we have on HIV prevalence per, per country. As you can see in the developing world, um, the cases are very highly concentrated. And this devastates economies because it destroys human capital. As you can see here by the World Bank statistics on life expectancy in, in African countries that have been heavily affected, uh, up, up to the, about the 1980s you've seen a consistent rise in life expectancy in Africa. And then when the HID, HIV epidemic started, you see this precipitous drop off. What happens when this life expectancy plummets is you lose your skilled workforce. Uh, not only do your, do you, your, young for, your workforce becomes younger, um, because there's also less incentive for people to educate themselves, to acquire knowledge and skills because they, from their perspective, they, they have no future. So why, why put the effort in? Furthermore, the economic impact of cancer is growing. This is the National Institute's health estimates of the uh, annual cost of cancer treatments um, by, by site. Um, and they did a numerous different estimates based upon certain assumptions about the cost of treatment. Uh, and uh, but at the baseline, what we see is they they look at the demographic trends, in particular our aging population. And with the aging population, as you can see, we have an increasing expenditure on health care treating people for cancer. Uh, as they estimate, in terms of the commonly occurring chronic diseases, cancer is the most expensive to, to treat per capita. But it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we can solve these challenges with what Paul Ehrlich calls um, magic bullets. That is, substances able to exert their full action exclusively on the disease while leaving the healthy tissue intact. So there are, in particular, uh, there is this new treatment called radioimmunotherapy, which is to, to put it succinctly, a highly disruptive technology. Um, there are numerous cancers right now undergoing clinical trials uh, utilizing this. There is, uh, in particular the types, there is prostate cancer, metastatic melanoma, ovarian cancer, neoplastic meningitis, leukemia, high-grade high -grade brain glioma, metastatic and metastatic colorectal cancer. In addition, at the uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, they did a clinical trial of radioimmunotherapy on HIV. And what they found was the patients treated with, with radioimmunotherapy had their HIV count drop below the detect detectable levels. 
So how do we, how do we produce uh, radio immunotherapy? So we have monoclonal antibodies function as the guidance for our magic bullet. They guide our munition to the target. In this case, we uh, stimulate the immune system of a mouse and then we, with the um, substance we want to target, and we collect the spleen cells, and then we merge the spleen cells with the cancer cell, and we have a cell line, and we either freeze that for further use or put it into production, either by injecting it back into a mouse or putting it into a mast cell culture. These produce the targeted antibodies which will bind to whatever most substances we want. And there's a huge variety of substances you can target these antibodies with. Um, the list I gave before of the various diseases is not an extensive one. Alpha or beta radiation is the munition. Uh, Alpha radiation is preferred uh, because if you look at the energy transfer density, so what happens is, is when you have a radioactive particle that, give, that gives off radiation, ch charge, travels pretty much as a line and scatters, um, and you look at how much energy is, is being transferred to the tissue per unit length, and what you find is that alpha radiation uh, dumps uh, over a thousand times uh, the energy density as beta radiation. Now, they're, they're currently beta radiation is being is more prevalent now, and the studies are looking to switch over to alpha radiation. Right now, the most common radioactive isotope used for the therapy is yttrium 90. Uh, so part of the reason why we want these charged particles is that their range is highly limited. Uh, they travel a certain distance and then they literally explode and dump a huge amount of energy at their terminus. They also, also create less secondary scattering, so you have less inelastic scattering, meaning that you don't kick off other particles which then go and interact, which gamma radiation and neutrons do. So you have a lot more control over where your radiation dose is being distri distributed with charged particles, in particular the alpha radiation. In particular, the, the substance that the medical studies are really excited about is bismuth-213. And the reason for that is that bismuth-213 gives off hard alpha radiation in, in the range of four to eight mega uh, alpha particles with energy in the range of four to eight mega electron volts. And seen here, is, I've displayed the decay chain from bismuth-213. Um, it could go two different ways, but, the, but ultimately you wind up with two, two alphas and two betas, and then you wind up with a long-lived bismuth-209. So what do they do? They take the bismuth 213 and they bond it to a chelating agent and then they bond the chelating agent to a protein. Uh, I listed the name here. They then take this complex con conjugate and they inject it into the patient. The drug selectively attaches to the cancer and then the alpha radiation kills the cancer cell with minimal collateral damage. And what happens afterwards is that the re recoil from the alpha particle uh, ejects the daughter of the radioactive isotope from the com compound, which they can then uh, chelate out with an additional chelating agent injected into the patient. In this, in this case here, this molecule so shown is dimercaparol, caparol, which is used to chelate out uh, if you have lead poisoning, for example. It has other uses as well for other metallic compounds. So we can manufacture bismuth-213 uh, with neutrons. Our feedstock would be, of course, thorium-232, the reason you're all here today. Uh, so what happens is, is we hit thorium-232 with a neutron, it, it transforms to protactinium, and then it goes through the Neptunium decay chain until we get to actinium-225. Now just hold that thought a little bit because I'll get to what happens when we get the actinium-225 in just a little bit. Another option is that we can hit radium with neutrons uh, and get onto the similar decay chain. 
However, uh, I've looked at doing this with radium and the challenge of radium versus thorium is that the industrial hazards of handling radium are far, far exceed the industrial hand hazards of handling thorium. And so it's a much difficult task to actually run the factory producing, using radium as a feedstock versus running the factory with thorium as a feedstock. Sure. One more back. One more back. Is this the right one? We can also manufacture actinium-225 with protons. Uh, again, using thorium-232 as a feedstock, we hit the thor thorium-232 with ideally 200 mega electron volt protons and we get multiple reactions that eventually lead to actinium-225. We can also do the same with radium with uh, lower energy protons but again we bump into the same brick wall of having to handle radium. Once we irradiate the target we then do uh, radium actinide and fission product separation. Uh, fission, fission is actually a side reaction in this uh, so we will get a, a few fission products in the mix and to get high purity we'll have to take them out. This is actually similar chemistry for what we'd have to do in a molten salt reactor. Okay, so once we get the actinium-225, this would be, so if we were running a company, this would be the product that we would then send off to the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we'd place actinium-225 in a generator uh, where it would decay and the output of this generator would be bismuth-213. So in order to get our particle sources, uh, we can actually form partnerships with national laboratories. In particular, uh, to, to put it bluntly, the vultures are circling around uh, the relativistic, uh, uh, the rel relativistic heavy ion collider in uh, Brookhaven National Laboratories. I know, I know the director would say otherwise, but they're really looking at the funding being cut for this. Uh, and with this application we could possibly get them a revenue stream that they can keep up their operations with if they would be amenable to that. If not, we can also explore commercial medical lineacs. These exist. In particular, uh, there are companies out right now that manufacture, that manufacture facilities for uh, particle therapy for cancer. Shown here was actually the first uh, particle therapy treatment uh, using a LINAC. Lin and so they are also an option. These companies do exist. The challenge is that thorium policy hinders development, much like the plot of the bio biopic movie of Dr. Ehrlichs, who was the original developer of the magic bullet. Here we have this uh, bureaucratic process that's really holding back innovation in the medical field. As a result of this, the demand for bismuth-213 is exceeding the supply. Uh, and in a SEC filing, uh, the la uh, we could actually do a market value. Uh, so it actually turns out that companies were so desperate for uh, for bismuth-213 that they were actually going to Russia to get their actinium-225. And so you can imagine uh, with recent news the, how well they're doing with that right now. Uh, the thorium repository is a solution as depicted in Bill S-2006. In particular in the bill there's a provision here for the development uh, of uses and markets for thorium including energy but also medical treatments. In particular we need the thorium-232 as a feedstock for, for treating cancer. So uh, when John gave his, his news today, it actually hit me very hard because I was, of course, pivoting my entire presentation on this, on this bill. And as he, he indicated, you know, there's, it looks like Congress is, is blocking this technology. 
which I find, I find really odd, to, to be honest, because this technology was promoted by President Obama in his 2012 State of the Union address. It makes me wonder, you know, well, you know, maybe it's a classic case of the right hand of the government not knowing what the left is doing. Um, but the, if Congress doesn't pass this bill, they're effectively undercutting a initiative of the president. <laughs> yeah, I know Congress has it out, but I think, but you know, it, it's it's really odd that that you know the. the the, the end result is that you have something that I think everyone would agree on. I think we've all, you know, I've been personally, I, I have relatives that have been affected by cancer. I believe we all have relatives that are affected by cancer. Uh, this isn't some far out there technology that needs millions of dollars. This is really something that could be self-sustaining. Uh, and it just, it just boggles my mind how this, how, how politics can get in the way of this. And, you know, and, and when John said DOD, DOD is blocking this, it, it really ticked me off uh, because, you know, we, I, can't, I can't know for sure what their intention is behind it. I can only speculate. But I just want to say this, is that defense Keynesianism doesn't work. I have, my family has three generations of experience, uh, three generations of scientists. All, all with interactions with the Department of Defense. Uh, in particular, my grandfather was one of the reactor designers for the Seawolf sodium-cooled submarine. Uh, he was a new nuclear reactor, nuclear physicist, and uh, eventually it got to the point where he left that industry for the private sector because he was just too fed up. He was just, I don't know the details, in, too much, all I've got is some of his personal correspondences, uh, but it seems like he was just too fed up with, with, the, with the work. What I do have, however, is a letter from his personal collection that you can see here uh, from a colleague of his. Uh, it was Optical Coding, optical coding Laboratory. Uh, and in this letter, he details that 80% of the funds was coming from the Department of Defense and NASA, uh, totaling about three million. And this was back in 1964. This was like at the height of, of military Keynesianism. And even then, the people working here knew that uh, this wasn't good. This wasn't good for business. You can see it right in his, right in his letter. Uh, He does say it's better than most, but the detail is, is the biggest challenge they had to their company was they could not, they could not compete with companies more oriented towards end consumers. In particular, Aqua Coding Laboratory could not, could not compete effectively with Bush and Loan. They were completely dependent upon DOD for their survival, and that's not a situation people want to be in. Another example, and this is part of my inspiration here, is Robert Laughlin, who was actually my field of quantum, quantum mechanics and quantum computing. Uh, he went to the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And his big thing there was that economic needs are now driving science, not military needs. Uh, he characterized a lot of what goes on in the military industrial academic complex as, and I quote, job protection. So what happens when people, when people get fed up with the, with the Keyes military Keynesianism? Your best talent goes on to greener pastures. In the case of Bill Gates, he formed a company called TerraPower, which took the engineers, the nuclear, nuclear physicists who worked on sodium-cooled reactors, and now they're, eyeing, eager, they're eagerly eyeing China to go and build it over there in cooperation with the Chinese government. So the other option I see right now, other than going on to greener pastures, is direct democracy. Now, you see TEA there. This is actually the Tea Party. And the reason I bring the Tea Party up is not necessarily that I agree with their policies, but I do think they were effective at getting their platform translated into legislative action. 
So that's why I want to leave with you as a thought of, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, I, I sincerely hope this bill passed, and I would love to see the congressmen who vote against this bill get asked why are they voting against cancer treatments. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kevin.